What's up guys, it's Trevor Hagen here. Today we are taking on the giant task of talking about Star Wars, more specifically, The Last Jedi, and its philosophies and religious symbolism throughout. Now, before I get started, I do have a disclaimer, and it's this. This is obviously, from my perspective, it could mean something completely different to you. I've actually noticed that, you know, obviously everybody wants to relate you know, the symbolism of Star Wars to their own philosophies and their own beliefs. And it usually actually works, making that a true testament to the brilliance of the Star Wars franchise. Um, however, coming from somebody that's currently unattached to any specific beliefs, and especially having been studying Eastern philosophy as of late, I really came out of the movie blown away at the diversity and the depth that this film contains. Now, before we get started, this also should be pretty obvious, but there are going to be some spoilers contained in this video. I'm not gonna be talking about the storyline in too much detail or how the film ends necessarily, but there are parts of the film that we're going to wanna dive into uh, in, with some detail. So, if you don't wanna hear any of that, I would say turn this off, go see the movie, and then come on back. However, this might also shed some light on some deeper aspects uh, to Star Wars that maybe you've never thought of before. And so if you don't mind, uh, you know, a few spoilers so that you can kind of understand the depth and symbolism uh, in the film, then this might actually make it a more enjoyable experience for you. Anyway, I'll leave that up to you. But with that, let's dive in. First of all, The Last Jedi, in my opinion, was a remarkably well done film. I understand that it's not perfect. I've talked to a lot of people that actually didn't really uh, love the storyline um, and different parts throughout, but what I really loved about it was it brought us back and it really hit on strongly um, of what the whole Star Wars franchise is all about, and that is the force, the use of the force and the polarity between good and evil. Um, there's a part in the movie where Rey is on the island and she has gone to look for Luke Skywalker. And uh, anyway, he asks her why she is there since he's trying to basically become a hermit and disappear and doesn't want, really want to be bothered. So anyway, she first responds with kind of a surface level answer about how the resistance sent her, all that kind of stuff. But then he looks at her like straight in the eye and asks her again, no, why are you here? And after thinking about it for a second, she she tells him that she has been able to feel something inside of her. And this is actually verbatim because I am uh, that big of a geek that's actually taking notes while I'm watching the film. But she says, it's always been there, but it has awakened and I'm scared. Now this to me sounds very similar to what you would call a Kundalini awakening. For those of you that don't know uh, really what that means, it's basically where um, a person is able to get their body completely alkaline and in a meditative state uh, so that the brain will produce DMT and serotonin naturally um, and, and, and then it's released into the pineal gland or as they call it, the third eye. So many would say that this is the esoteric mystery that is the fountainhead of all religious faiths. Um, and people that have this experience, whether it was intentional or an accident, and it can be on accident, I know of somebody personally that um, it actually happened to on accident. But they say that there's so much knowledge and insight that comes to them that oftentimes they're not ready for it. And it can seem a little bit scary or a bit, bit too much for them to handle or digest at the time. Now this is a very surface level definition of Kundalini, so I do suggest you look into it if that interests you. But this is the closest thing that I can relate this to. Um, anyway, Luke ends up telling her that she needs a teacher and uh, very reluctantly kind of gives in to her convincing um, for him to, to instruct her. So fast forward a little bit in the film, they end up going uh, on this hill on the island that looks over the ocean and he begins in the same way that any good guru would and that is by basically poking fun at the whole idea of finding the force. Uh, he has her stick out her hand and she closes her eyes and he ends up uh, taking a little branch and kind of like tickling her fingers with it. And he's like, can you feel that? And she's, you know, getting all excited like, yeah, yeah, I can feel it. And then he slaps her hand with the branch as if to teach her that anything outside of her that she can perceive with her five senses is definitely 
not the force. And he then goes on to teach her something that to me sounded uh, very much like a, a Buddhist teaching, which is basically about the yin and yang of polarity, um, the interconnectivity of the whole thing, and the importance of finding the balance in between. You know, some examples that I've heard when it comes to polarity and finding balance, it's kind of like, uh, you know, a hill, being on top of the hill and looking at the side that goes down and realizing that it looks just like the side going up. Um, or in the same way that you use a steering wheel, you're, you're never only pushing or just pulling. It's always a constant mix of the two in perfect balance and practice that actually moves the car in the right direction. So anyway, these are all Eastern teachings of finding balance within ourselves, and I could see a lot of parallels there. Luke also teaches Ray something very important, and that's the idea that the Force doesn't belong solely to the Jedi, and so it won't die with the Jedi. I loved that because no matter what idea you know, we want to attach to the Force, um, it's important to know that no specific group or people own that Force. It's something that we already have in the moment that we were born. Um, it's something that we all own and we can all awaken within us. And uh, Yoda actually says when he, which by the way, I love the Yoda that they used in this film because it was like a throwback to the original Yoda. Anyway, he says to Luke, um, talking about the Jedi books, like their scriptures, so to speak, that it's time for him to look past a bunch of old books because the books don't contain anything that the girl doesn't already possess. Anyway, there's so many great uh, stories that are woven throughout this. But anyway, before Rey leaves the island and, and feels ready, she, she actually travels down to this cave that seemed to be like calling her name the whole time. The opening of the cave actually looked like a giant eyeball to me. But anyway, she goes down in hoping to like, you know, uh, see something or hear something that's going to uh, finally give her the key, you know, and empower her or whatever. But instead, she's faced with a giant reflection of herself. It's like a big mirror and, uh, and she's forced to see the infinite within herself. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail of the visuals there um, because there are... I mean, there's so many different ways to dissect it, but the one thing that popped out to me was uh, that there was the law of resonance that was so beautifully visualized there. And, uh, you know, m most people have heard of the law of attraction by the popular uh, movie, The Secret. Um, you've heard of, you know, the law of polarity, but, uh, but there, are so m there, there are other laws uh, governing our universe. Uh, you could call them universal laws, divine laws, whatever. Um, and one of them is the law of resonance, meaning that our reality and what we attract to it is actually based on the energy that we project before the thought even arises. And that energy will manifest itself and continue throughout the infinite abyss of time and space, all based on controlling. And I wouldn't maybe say controlling but I would say being aware and uh, directing our emotions and realizing that we are not our emotions. We feel certain things and then we can, you know, allow that to control our brain that materializes thoughts or not. Anyway, I know this is a super deep thought, but it's worth exploring because so is this movie. It's very deep in its uh, symbolism and, um, and different ideas that it's trying to convey through story. So. Um, there's also a moment of, of androgyny that happens in that same cave sequence where she's wanting to see her, her parents and she ends up seeing kind of blurry images of the two and they come together and the, and the union makes her reflection. Um, and to me, that symbolizes the male and female energy that exists within us and the good and evil that always exists within us. Um, you know, there's never, you know, just... 100% male or female in a person. Um, and we're not just made up of 100%, you know, good or evil. Uh, it's really the law of polarity that exists within us and the balance that we need to find between it all. So anyway, there's obviously so much more to this film and I could honestly talk for hours, but probably my favorite takeaway from the film is that it really teaches us to always love first. Toward the end of the film, Finn is about to make like a suicide mission to destroy this giant laser cannon that's just going to wipe out the rest of their race. When Rose, a new character in the film, 
she comes and she sideswipes him, takes out his aircraft and everything, and essentially saves his life, which, you know, the accident of that didn't kill him, but um, that's a different story. Anyway, he jumps out of his pod or whatever, and then uh, when he goes, like, runs up to her and asks her why she did what she did, you know, when he was so close to destroying that, um, she says, that is how we win. It's not by fighting what we hate, but by saving what we love. I absolutely love how they illustrated that and how we should view our enemies. I've actually been thinking a lot about that as of late, about loving our enemies. And I came to the realization that if we don't actually love our enemies, we don't learn to do that, then we will become our enemies. Because hate is such a powerful emotion um, and it works with the law of attraction and resonance as we were talking about, that you attract what you think about the most and what you feel the most. You actually become what you feel the most. And eventually, you will end up taking the same actions that your enemies did because you will justify it since it's for the right reasons. Um, you know, and it's funny because that is all based on perspective as well. And that's another thing that you can see in this film um, is that, uh, you know, it, it has you question for a minute, like who are the bad guys and who are the good guys? Um, because, you know, you'll realize and no matter what film you watch, whatever perspective you're viewing it for, that is the group of people that you're rooting for because it's most familiar to you and you kind of fall in love with the characters. And um, so no matter what, you know, means it takes to the end that's going to be best for them is the good purpose. And so there's a lot that we can learn about that as well. Um, another reason, though, to love your enemies is because uh, no one is really ever gone. And I don't mean that in the sense that, you know, there are spirits around us or, you know, anything like that, which I'm not saying there's not either, but I'm just saying that those feelings and that energy that we create um, has the power to haunt you with that same hate that you created for them. Um, and when they're gone, it's, it's hell because uh, it, it's very difficult to get rid of that. And, uh, Luke actually appears in the same scene uh, at, towards the end of the film, um, actually as an energy being, and he teaches Kylo Ren that if he strikes him down in anger, then he will always be with him. So anyway, there's a lot that we can learn there. Now, before I end, I got to say, to really understand the philosophy of Star Wars and the philosophies around it, you need to understand the life and the mind of the creator. George Lucas has a history of studying Eastern philosophy, um, loves Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism. He actually studied transcendental meditation um, pretty heavily uh, around the time just before he, he uh, wrote Star Wars, uh, learning with Maharishi shortly after the Beatles did in India. He actually still practices it today. In fact, many say that he crafted Yoda after Maharishi himself, which would make sense to me because there are a lot of overlapping mannerisms there. If you've ever watched any uh, videos of, of uh, Maharishi, he does a lot of the... Nothing remains subconscious. Hmm? He'll enjoy all this nature to the maximum. And, uh, and so, yeah, you can see that. But more than that, the teachings go hand in hand. If you, if you look at the force and the science of consciousness, um, anyway, there, there are websites that draw the parallels much better than I can right now, but, um, but there are a lot of them. So you got to check that out. Just look up Yoda and Maharishi, I think. But, uh, but Lucas once said himself, there needs to be a kind of film that expresses the mythological realities of life the deeper psychological movements of the way we conduct our lives. And it's more specific in Buddhism, but it is a notion that's been around even before that. Now, if you're interested in what that might be, what those teachings might be, even before Buddhism, which was 500 years before Christ, I would suggest looking into Taoism, Hinduism, and even Zoroastrianism. These are three of the world's most uh, like the oldest religions that actually still exist today. Um, actually, I just released a video this week. Uh, you can see it on my channel uh, on Hinduism and reincarnation if that interests you. I also talked about Taoism last week, and I'm going to be covering Zoroastrianism probably sometime in January. But really, Eastern thought is very strong in this movie. The whole 
telepathic thing going on, the levitation, the yogic powers. These are all very well documented as real happenings in Hindu culture and history. I'm not saying that they are real. I'm just saying that for them, uh, these are things that have actually happened. And, you know, many Christians might point uh, to the force as more of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost that we can feel within us. Um, but the, the, the issue that I have with that is that the movie clearly depicts a duality in the usage of the force. Meaning, though the force is one, the movie depicts how the, depicts how the Jedi masters use it selflessly for the welfare of the people wh while the dark lords use it to attain power and rule over others. So this is very much uh, similar to the Hindu conception of Shakti. Shakti is both binding and liberating and people can decide how they should use the power. And to kind of bleed into a different philosophy and religion altogether, the Jedi masters are actually trained in self-control, calmness, um, selflessness um, in using the force for the greater good and they're also expected to practice celibacy and to renounce all emotional attachment as they aim to strengthen strengthen their connection with the force and remain established with that union and so that to me sounds like it bleeds over into Taoism a lot so obviously there are several philosophies going on at the same time in Star Wars that are all webbed together and which is brilliant because that's exactly like the world that we live in. And, and I'm sure that there are Christian influences and symbols to be found throughout the film. Um, they didn't really pop out to me as much as Eastern philosophy and religion did. But I, I guess the real question would come down to this. Is the force impersonal or is it embodied? Um, from what I can gather, everything powerful seems to stem from within the characters, not as much... Um, a source from outside of them will, w that will save them, especially some sort of like anthropomorphic being, but also the force is not inherently good or evil. Um, but anyway, I would love any insights there. So feel free to leave comments, you guys. Uh, in, in my opinion, um, the aspect of Christianity is seen really in the final conflict, and that's between this idea, um, uh, this Buddhist idea, um, of letting go and the chivalry and loyalty that is found in Christianity. Um, so anyway, at the end of the day, just like any great film can teach us, we're merely looking at a cloak that drapes over things that are essential and true. So make of it what you will, but I hope that you enjoyed this perspective and take on The Last Jedi. And to end, one of my favorite quotes in the movie, it's all a machine, so live free and don't join. May the force be with you. Stay curious, you guys. We'll see you next time.